Welcome to this online lesson on the British Empire. I've called this lesson Land of Hope and Glory with a very deliberate question mark. Because for some people, the British Empire did indeed spread hope and glory around the world. However, for an awful lot more, and especially as we look back at it with modern eyes, we realise that the British Empire's story around the world was a lot more complex than that. And in fact, it spread an awful lot of suffering too. You will have to make your mind up as to whether it did more good or whether it caused more suffering by looking at the examples that we'll study within this lesson. Therefore, our aims today are to consider different aspects of the British Empire and to make a judgment about a part of Britain's history. A part of Britain's history that's increasingly controversial as we re-evaluate the events of the past. Let's consider some key terms and some context behind this topic. In 1902, Britain had the largest empire in the world, and British people were very proud to be the most powerful and wealthy country of all. The empire had started in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I at around 1600, but it was at its biggest between 1800 and 1945, so roughly from the reign of Queen Victoria until the end of World War II. This made many people in Britain feel very patriotic. Arguably, it still does even now. So what do these words mean? Firstly, empire. An empire is a group of countries that are all controlled or owned by another country. This is usually by colonisation, where people move their own settlers there, or by conquest, by sending the armed forces in and taking it over by force. The other word is patriotic. This is a feeling of love or pride for one's country or nation. If you're unfamiliar with these words, it'd be a good idea to note them down now with their definitions, which you can choose to write in your own words if you want. Alternatively, you could give an example from your own knowledge that shows these words, perhaps an example of another empire that you've studied, or an example of how patriotism is shown by people today. Pause the video now while you complete that. So, other empires you might have studied then. Well, consider this. The Roman Empire is one of the largest empires before the British Empire came along, although it's a lot more ancient. And what about patriotism? People who sing the national anthem, for example, might be considered patriotic or wave the national flag. But there are other ways of showing patriotism too. We're now going to consider a very famous British patriotic song, Land of Hope and Glory. This is where I got the lesson title name from. Land of Hope and Glory, Mother of the Free, How might we extol thee who are born of thee? Wider still and wider shall thy bounds be set. God who made thee mighty, make thee mightier yet. God who made thee mighty, make thee mightier yet. You'll all be very grateful that I didn't actually sing that. However, what I recommend you do is load up the video that I've linked in the description and listen to that while you answer these questions. Oh, but before we do that, here's a couple of those strange uh, and old fashioned words explained. If you extol something, it means that you praise it very highly. Bounds in this particular context means boundaries, so British owned land. So wider still and wider shall thy bounds be set means to make the empire bigger. So these questions you can complete during the video, which lasts about four minutes. Explain briefly what the song might mean. As you listen to the video, how do you feel when you hear this song? There's no wrong answer to that, it's your own reaction on hearing the piece of music. But then explain why you feel like it. And again, no wrong answer to that, your reaction to a piece of music is entirely individual and down to you. Pause the video now while you listen to the song and complete those questions. So basically what the song is saying is that Britain is a land of glory and it's a land of freedom. It's also saying that the British people should praise the, the British Empire and that it should become bigger and bigger. Why? Because God says so. It's saying that uh, Britain has become so rich and wealthy because God has made it so. Actually, it's probably got an awful lot more to do with other things, such as slavery and such as the Industrial Revolution, which we've covered in previous lessons. Many people, when they hear this song, feel a surge of patriotism, of love for their country, and it's not unusual to see people waving Union Jack flags when they're, they're singing this particular song. However, your reaction is individual and down to you, so there's no wrong answer to that. This map here shows the British Empire at its greatest extent. This is the British Empire as it was at its largest just before World War I, which started in 1914. Virtually every classroom in the country would have had a world map in it with the British Empire coloured pink, like I've done here. 
It was often said at this time that the sun never sets on the British Empire. What do you think was meant by this? Answer that question, but also have a look at the link in the description where you can get your own map like this, and if you're able to, you could print it out and colour in your own map of the British Empire. Make sure that you include a key showing which colour that you've used and where the, the fact that that represents the British Empire. So pause the video while you complete those tasks. So what about this statement, the sun never sets on the British Empire? Well have a look at all the pink countries that are on the map here. They extend in the west from Canada, all the way through to the east through most of Africa, India, and even down to Australia and New Zealand. The idea was that at any time of day, regardless of what time of day it was where you were, somewhere in the British Empire the sun was shining, because it went all the way around the world. But there's a handy double meaning in this too. It was the idea that the sun would never set on the British Empire, meaning it could never end as well. Of course that last point is completely untrue. The British Empire is basically all gone now. Later on we'll find out possibly what happened. I very deliberately structured this lesson so we look at all the positives that the Empire brought for Britain first, and then we begin to challenge that view later on in the lesson. So if you're feeling like this is all very one-sided so far, fair enough, it's designed to be that way, but you will get the opportunity to question this more traditional view of the Empire later on. So why did the British want an Empire in the first place? There were many advantages for Britain in having a large Empire. What you're going to have here is that you'll be shown a selection of factors about the British Empire. You'll need to write them out and put them in the correct part of the Venn diagram. I'll demonstrate with the, uh, with the first one so you can see how this should be laid out. Once you've done all that, an extension would be this. Choose the three most significant advantages, or good things for Britain, and highlight them. Explain why you think they are the most important. So first of all, you can draw a Venn diagram like this. This Venn diagram will have three sections and overlapping sections in the middle. So this might be a little bit tricky to draw, and make sure you can draw it big enough that you can write plenty of numbers within it. Trade and wealth, military and power, culture and pride. Note how these different sections overlap with each other. So culture and pride overlaps with trade and wealth, trade and wealth overlaps with military and power, military and power overlaps with culture and pride, and then all three overlap in the middle. So let's have a look at our first example. 1. British people took great pride in having the largest empire and armed forces in the world. So note that down in your book or on your piece of paper that you're using, and then write down the number 1 in the correct part of the Venn diagram. So this is about the British people taking great pride, so we've got a bit of a clue there in having the largest empire and armed forces in the world. So there's a mention of pride and there's a mention of the armed forces. So I would put this one in this section here, overlapping culture and pride with military and power. Remember culture would also relate to anything like art, music, poetry and language too. Trade and wealth would be anything to do with um, be becoming rich and buying and selling things. And military and power would be regarding uh, Britain's armed forces and the way that Britain was perceived by others as a powerful nation. So that's our first one done as an example. Pause the video here while you note down your first one and as you complete your Venn diagram. Hopefully you've drawn your Venn diagram now and have completed the first factor. There's going to be another 13 now for a total of 14. Where is this one going to go in the Venn diagram? Britain could get materials and goods from other countries that weren't available in the UK. OK, where is this going to go in our Venn diagram? Give it some thought. So if it's about materials and goods, it's probably to do with trade and wealth. Is it to do with anything else? Not directly. So that one will probably just go within trade and wealth. Anyway, pause the video here, note that down, and complete the Venn diagram. On the next one, you're not going to get any help. Alright, let's have a look at number three. You won't get any help with this one. Britain could trade valuable goods with its empire and make lots of money. Pause the video while you decide where that should go, and while you note down the factor. Number four, 
You need a massive army to control a large empire, so Britain's army was one of the largest in the world. Decide where that factor goes and note down the factor. Pause the video now. Number five. Countries in the empire could provide skilled soldiers for their, of their own that can be used in British wars. Okay, consider where that one might go. Hopefully you've noted down that factor now and decided which part of the Venn diagram it goes in. Let's have a look at number six. Britain had the largest navy and merchant or cargo fleets in the world to serve its huge empire. So this is all about Britain's strength at sea. But remember, cargo fleets also bring the goods back from the empire to Britain. So where does this one go? Pause the video while you note it down and decide. Number seven. The English language got lots of new words from the empire. Bungalow, for example, is an Indian word. There are lots of others too, many of them coming from, uh, from Indian. For example, khaki, that sort of greeny brown colour that you get on military clothing. It comes from an Indian word meaning dust. Anyway, have a decide of where that one should go and pause the video while you note it down. All right, we're halfway through now. Number eight, British sports like cricket, rugby and football were shared with the empire nations. Think, for example, how many nations play cricket today and rugby. The Rugby World Cup is dominated by countries that used to be in the British Empire, although not entirely anymore. So, note down that particular factor and decide where that goes within the Venn diagram. Pause the video now. Number nine. Having a huge army and empire meant other countries were less likely to attack Britain. Okay, write that one down, put it in the Venn diagram, pause the video. You know the drill by now. Number ten. British people took great pride in having the largest empire and armed forces in the world. All right, note it down. Number 11. Many British songs and poems are written to celebrate the empire. Which part of the Venn diagram does that go, go in? Note down the number, note down the factor and press uh, play when you're ready to continue. Three to go. Number 12. People in Britain celebrated the empire on Empire Day with big street parties. OK, decide where that's going to go in the Venn diagram and note the factor down. Press pause now. Second to last one. The size of the empire meant Britain had military bases all over the world. Other countries often did as Britain told them to. Some of these military bases still survive to this day. Consider, for example, the Falkland Islands and Gibraltar. Both of them remain British possessions. OK, pause the video and note it down. Last one. Art and culture are borrowed from around the world and used in Britain. For example, Brighton Pavilion, which I've put a picture of at the top, was built in an Indian style, for example. Also remember that the British Empire meant that the British uh, came into possession of many historical antiquities too. For example, the British Empire, sorry, the British Museum is filled with artefacts that were gathered during the time of the British Empire. Many of the countries these were taken, um, had these taken from, uh, actually want these artefacts back, which often causes some controversy. So, without further ado, note down this last factor, complete your Venn diagram, and then make sure that you do the extension too if you have time. Pause the video while you complete those final tasks. Hopefully by the end of that, you've got a very detailed collection of all the reasons why the British were so fond of having an empire. You should also be able to see that this is a mixture of having trade and wealth and making the country rich, having pride and enriching British culture, and also having a very strong defence and offensive military power. And it's that last one in particular which makes the British Empire quite notorious. We're going to look now at some of the other side, the other side of the story. So brilliant, for Britain at least, the British Empire has made Britain the most powerful, wealthy and culturally rich country on earth. Or at least that was the state of play at the end of the 19th century. But wait, is that the whole story? 
Did everybody benefit from the British Empire? If the empire was so fantastic, then why does it no longer exist? Let's consider India as just one case study. Were they winners or losers from the British Empire? One of the legacies of the British Empire in India is its incredibly well-used and popular rail service. The railways in India were originally built under the command of the British Empire, although it should be said that it was largely by using labour from India itself. Nevertheless, the old steam trains that used to run on these lines were built in British factories like in Glasgow. Also, the Indian love of cricket. Yes, they really are a cricketing nation that completely obsesses over their favourite sport, in a way that this country simply doesn't. In fact, cricket spread across the British Empire. Notice that this is India versus Afghanistan, both of which were part of the British Empire, or at least under British rule uh, and influence, for part of the 19th and 20th centuries. But there's a dark side too. In exchange for these things, the Indians had to give up their freedom. And mostly this was not done voluntarily, but through force. There were uprisings against British rule at various times. And these uprisings were put down in a most brutal way. Here in this picture, we can see an artist's impression of the end of what was called the Indian Mutiny, or what is often called in India today, the First War of Independence. Key leaders were tied to the front of cannons and had cannonballs shot straight through them. This was done brutally and publicly as a very public display of the British Empire's power. It was designed to terrify the Indians into not resisting British rule again. So it is quite a complex story, this. So it is often uh, helpful to consider the different sides to a story here. Good versus bad is, yes, simplistic. However, it helps us to get in our frame of mind the different effects that the British Empire had. Britain definitely benefited from the empire, but did the rest of the world. Many people in the empire did not enjoy being controlled by Britain. Others really liked it and got a lot of power and money. So here is what our investigation is going to look like. We're now going to consider what type of people were the winners in the empire and which people were not. Some are real, others are based upon real types of people who left few records behind and so I've had to make up some of their details. But believe me, it is based upon real history. You'll see summaries about different people on the, the screen explaining how the empire affected them. Create your own version of this table leaving plenty of space on each line for a sentence or two of explanation. So, for example, one of our first people we're going to look at is a slave girl called Sarah. Slaves very rarely left records behind, and so she's one of my more fictional characters, if you like. But, as we have seen in previous lessons, we know that African slavery really happened. So, note down for key facts about her story. The opinion, her opinion of the empire, whether she had a good opinion or a bad opinion of the empire. And why did uh, someone like Sarah hold this opinion? You will then see some others and you'll be able to complete your table. There will be four examples in total. So press pause while you complete your table, making sure that you've got plenty of space for the, sub the subsequent characters, and then we'll have a look at the summaries. Press pause now. Okay, let's consider the story of Sarah the Slave Girl. My name is Sarah. Her era falls from about 1600 to 1800, or rather that's the, the kind of heyday of British slave trading. My name is Sarah, except that's not my real name. It was given to me by my owners. I used to be a villager in West Africa. That was until some white Englishmen came along and stole me and lots of other people from my village. We were brought here to the British Caribbean colonies as slaves, and I've had n no freedom ever since. All I do is backbreaking work in the fields for no pay, while the British make all the money. I'll never see my home again, or ever have my freedom. If you want to learn more about slavery, I've got some other video lessons on those. However, for the time being, complete your table based upon Sarah's story. Note down what key facts there are, what Sarah's opinion of the British Empire was, and why she held that opinion. Pause the video while you do this. Okay, our next person. This is from a little bit later in history. My name is Robert Clive. He was dominant in India from about 1757 onwards. In 1757, I won a great battle called the Battle of Plassey. This victory made India part of the British Empire. 
even better than this, is that it made me fabulously wealthy. The East India Company, which has bought and sold goods all over the world for many years, now controls all of the wonderful goods in India. The East Indian Company can now bring tea, spices, silk and many other things back to Britain whilst being protected by the army. This will make Britain, and me, very rich. Okay, this is quite something to get your head around, but effectively, to begin with, India was conquered by a private trading company with British backing, which made Britain rich, but also brought lots of luxury goods to Britain. Later on, Britain more form formally took over India as a whole. So, based upon this information, what are the key facts of Robert Clive's story? Not only that, but what is his opinion of the empire? And why would he hold that opinion? Press pause while you make these notes. Okay, our third story is about to appear. But before we do, I've just put a picture of the tortoise up. This is a tortoise called Adwaita, or Adwaita. This tortoise died in 2005. Why have I put the tortoise up there? Well, because this is one of the tortoises that was owned by Robert Clive. That's right, it lived over 250 years. So, imagine if that tortoise could talk, what stories it could tell. Anyway, on to our third person. This is someone else connected with India and in a more modern era. My name is Gandhi. He was particularly active during the 1940s, but was also active before that as well. I was born in India in 1869. During my life, I have seen how the British have controlled India and taken her wealth for herself. I have also seen how violent and brutal the British army can be when they want to take back control. I want India to become independent. This means that India will rule itself and not be controlled by Britain. Indian soldiers have fought for Britain in World War I and World War II. It's only fair that Britain says thank you to India by giving her power back. Incidentally, that is precisely what happened. After the war, India was partitioned between Pakistan, Bangladesh and India, which itself brought a lot of conflict, but they, they left the British Empire and they became independent nations as they are today. Crucially, Gandhi was famous for using non-violent tactics. He realised that violence didn't work against the British Empire because they were so much stronger militarily than the Indians. Instead, by using non-violent tactics and by changing the mind of the world, they could get what they want. And Gandhi succeeded in this with the people who supported him. So, press pause now and you can note down the key facts behind Gandhi's story his opinion of the British Empire, and why he might hold that opinion. Press pause now. So check back your table and make sure that you've got everything that you need. This is a good opportunity to check these stories again, and if you want to, you can press the uh, pause on the video and press play when you're ready to continue. We're going to move on to our fourth and final example now, which we'll look at in somewhat more detail as something of a case study. Have a look at this photograph. This picture was taken in a concentration camp. What do you already know about concentration camps? Some of you who've got a bit of historical knowledge already will recognise this term as relating to Hitler and the Nazis in World War II. Concentration camps were places where the, the Nazis put people they considered enemies. These were basically innocent people, often Jewish people. But what about if I tell you this? How would you feel now that you know that this photo was taken in 1901, not during World War II? The camp was not run by the Nazis. It's a British concentration camp. That's right. The British Empire created the idea of the concentration camp. Although I should point out, it was rather different to what the Nazis later created. So why did these things come about. You might want to add this as a bit of a subheading elsewhere within your notes, but it all relates to something called the Boer War, 1899 to 1902. This would be one of the most famous wars in all of British history if it wasn't for about 15 years later something else happening called World War I. It took place in South Africa. We can see the geography of South Africa at this time in the map on the right. The South African Republic and Transvaal is shown in green, with the Orange Free State in orange, the British Cape Colony in blue, and the Natal in red. 
At this time, these areas were being colonised by Europeans or had already been colonised by Europeans for some time. The British wanted to bring it more fully under its control and take the wealth from that area. But not everyone wanted them to. The Boers were Dutch-speaking farmers in the south of Africa. They lived in states by the Brit which were right next to the British-controlled areas of the South African Republic and Natal. The Boers wanted independence, and the British wanted to control this, this gold-rich area, as it would make the British Empire even richer and bigger. Caught between both, of course, and let's not forget this, were the native black Af African population. It's easy to tell the Boer War story just from the point of view of the European uh, descended people who were fighting it, and unfortunately this means that much of the history of this particular war completely ignores the experience of the black native peoples. However, the Boers knew their land well, and they used it to their advantage, dealing several heavy defeats on the more highly trained and larger British army. I've got a link in the description of this video which gives us about a 10 minute summary of the Boer War. I really urge you to watch this as it gives us a really good insight into what we're going to look at next. So we're going to look at the case of Boer concentration camps, and if you've seen the video you'll have already got some details about this. The British army was humiliated by Boer guerrilla fighters. Guerrilla fighters are those that fight a small scale hit and run war that's really effective at annoying, harassing and delaying a much bigger army. They decided to try and control the Boer people by destroying their farms. Civilians therefore needed to be relocated and concentrated in a different location, in other words, brought together. Concentration camps were set up to accommodate the families of Boers who had either surrendered or who had been made homeless. They were never meant to be places of murder, but through a combination of carelessness, neglect and sheer incompetence, they were. The fact that they share their name with the Nazi concentration camps of mass murder is an unfortunate coincidence, but that doesn't alter the fact that 27,927 Boer civilians died in British concentration camps. Most of them were women and children, because they were the ones who were not fighting in the war and had been relocated from their homes. I'm going to show you a very unpleasant image now, which really brings this home to us. At this period in history, photographs had existed for some time. A woman investigating the concentration camps was a Cornish woman called Emily Hobhouse. In one concentration camp, she encountered an eight-year-old girl, Lizzie Van Zyl. This is how she found her. Lizzie Van Zyl was dying from starvation and typhoid fever. Not long after this photograph was taken, she had died. It's a really horrible image, but it's a true image of how some people suffered under British rule and as a result of the British Empire. And we should never ignore that, that historical fact. So Emily Hobhouse is the remarkable woman who brought the suffering of the Boers to the attention of the British public and the rest of the world. In 1901, Cornish woman Emily Hobhouse visited the concentration camps. Her vivid, honest descriptions caused grief and outrage across the world, including in Britain. This is what I'd like you to do, and this is quite challenging. What can you learn from Hobhouse's description about the conditions in the concentration camps and whether the British meant the conditions to be that bad? This is part of her report. I call this camp system a wholesale cruelty. To keep these camps going is murder to the children. It can never be wiped out of the memories of the people. It presses hardest on the children. They droop in the terrible heat and with the insufficient, unsuitable food. Whatever you do, whatever the authorities do, and they are, I believe, doing their best with very limited means, it is all only a miserable patch on a great ill. Thousands, physically unfit, are placed in conditions of life which they have not strength to endure. In front of them is blank ruin. If only the English people would try to exercise a little imagination, picture the whole miserable scene. Entire villages rooted up and dumped in a strange, bare place. Okay, this is quite challenging stuff, but note down what this can teach you about the conditions in the camps and whether the British meant the conditions to be that bad. Pause the video now. Okay, so there's various details about these conditions. 
Firstly, this idea that the heat was intolerable and that the people were giving very little food and certainly not enough. The fact that children were suffering more than others and the fact that thousands of physically un unfit people were being put into uh, conditions which they would not survive. Also, the idea that this is entire communities of Boer people being taken from one place and placed in another. Hobhouse is keen to point out, though, that the British didn't mean it to be this bad. She says, for example, I believe they are doing their best with very limited means. However, is that really an excuse? Surely just saying, well, I didn't mean it to be this bad does not excuse this thing when they should have planned ahead for it, or perhaps not done it in the first place. Just saying that you are doing your best is rarely any particular defence for when things go wrong, unless it really isn't your fault. And I think it could be argued here, including by Hobhouse, that actually the British could have done better here, but they didn't care enough. So, what you could do now is you could add Emily Hobhouse's uh, particular knowledge to your table. And when you've done that, we're going to complete a written task. Now use the knowledge and opinions that you've developed in this lesson to make a judgment about the British Empire. Firstly, describe what the British Empire was. Keep this factual. Secondly, give some detailed examples of what made the British Empire a good thing for the British and explain why they were good for Britain's wealth and power. Thirdly, give some examples of what made the British Empire a bad thing, especially for the people who suffered under it, and explain why some people suffered under British rule. Based on these examples and others that you have learned, what is your opinion? There's no wrong answer here as long as you back it up correctly. Explain with examples whether you think the British Empire was mostly a good thing or mostly a bad thing. And you could start that by saying, I think the British Empire was either mostly bad, all good or partly good, and state how good or bad you think the empire was. And then you can say, why? Remember to include real examples that you've gathered throughout the lesson, and you should have plenty by now. This will take you about 15 to 20 minutes to do, and is almost the last thing I'm going to ask you to do in this lesson. So pause the video here while you complete this task. A reminder that there were some advantages that the British Empire brought to the world, and plenty of examples of bad things too. So I return to our lesson title, Land of Hope and Glory. Do you think that the British Empire deserves such a title, or not? There's no wrong answer to this. Simply decide, base it upon what you've learnt this lesson, and realise that actually the British Empire is such a huge topic that this one lesson alone cannot possibly do it justice. But keep an open mind. There are some things that you will hear that you will think are incredible, and they might even make you feel proud. There are many things, though, which represent tremendous human suffering, and it's difficult to feel proud of that. And on that note, that's the end of the lesson. I'll say thank you for watching. I hope it's been helpful, and if it has, then please like this video and subscribe to the channel. Goodbye.